Dit is Papa Alfa 0 Eco, Tingo Eco voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate voor vandaag, 26 maart 2016. Today we have an announcement in Dutch and the rest of the bulletin will be in English. We also have Morse code, some data which is in Hell X9 around 1500 Hz. Hell X9 around 1500 Hz. And we have a small picture in SSTV BW12. Morgen, of als je naar de ochtendherhaling luistert vandaag al, vindt voor het eerst de landelijke paasronde plaats op PI2 NOS. Het betreft hier een spontaan initiatief van mijn naamgenoot PD1 LAM, die de ronde met assistentie van Gert PA9F zal leiden. De ronde vindt plaats op zondag 27 maart dus, vanaf 1300 uur via PI2 NOS. Gezien het succes van de eerdere kerstrondes zal het ongetwijfeld weer erg gezellig zijn. Houd er overigens rekening mee dat de klok vannacht van naar zomertijd gaat. 1300 uur morgen is dus de tijd die vandaag nog 12 uur was. Althans, ik hoop dat ik me niet vergis. Dus nog even resumerend. Jij eerst? Nee, ik eerst. Doe maar samen dan. Oké, okay. let, let op. Eerste paasdag vanaf 1 uur zomertijd vindt op PI2 NOS de eerste landelijke paasronde plaats door PD1 LAM. Today we have an item by Radio Prague on espionage, propaganda and number stations. Just like last week, the propagation bulletin will be on Sunday. Now, Czech history, as I said, we look at the aspect of the Cold War, that is, the use of secret agents to spy on this and disrupt the enemy's propaganda services. In particular, Chris Johnston looks at the circus that surrounded the return of a Czechoslovak double agent named Pavel Minazik 40 years ago in 1976, when he was aimed at discrediting the US-financed and Munich-based broadcaster Radio Free Europe. Chris Johnston has that. <laughs> Radio Free Europe was undoubtedly a thorn in the side of the communist regime. Radio Free Europe started its services in 1950 with the first broadcast to Czechoslovakia. The full service was up and running in 1951. It quickly gathered a team of broadcasters, overwhelmingly anti-communist exiles, and also possessed an impressive information collecting network on the other side of the Iron Curtain. It was such an irritant that the communist regime quickly developed its jamming services to block the transmissions. Historian at Prague's Military History Institute and the author of a book about Radio Free Europe, Prokop Tomek, takes up the story. The State Security Service, the STB, overwhelmingly wanted to target the exile movement abroad and also to discredit them in the eyes of the Czechoslovak public at home and also to attack Radio Free Europe because the broadcaster was sort of a particular enemy and symbol of opposition for the Czechoslovak regime. In the 1950s, the Czechoslovak Secret Service managed to infiltrate Radio Free Europe with agents. There was even a failed attempt to poison staff at the Czech and Slovak sections with poison in the canteen salt cellars in 1959. But to some extent, Prague's efforts were outclassed by those of the Polish Communist Secret Service. They sent an agent who functioned for six years before returning to Warsaw in 1971 in a blaze of publicity, embarrassing the Western broadcaster and US government. Later than the Poles, the Czechoslovak Secret Service adopted similar plans. Prokop Tomic again. Pavel Minazik was recruited as an agent in Czechoslovakia by the STB in 1967. He was a professional radio announcer in Brno, and it was planned, therefore, that he would be sent abroad, if possible, to Munich and Radio Free Europe. That took place eventually in September 1968, and he quickly got a job at the radio and became an announcer. He was tasked with collecting all the information he could about the employees at Radio Free Europe and the broadcast plans. Of course, he had a fairly low grade, he was just an announcer, and did not have the possibility of influencing the programs day-to-day or intervening in any other ways, which would obviously have been a lot more interesting from the STB's point of view. But Pavel Minarik also had a broader role, which Munich, a centre for communist exiles, was well placed to fulfil. 
potom taky získával informace i z různých exilových organizací. He also collected information about various exile organizations and movements of which there were many. And that was also interesting for the state security service. So it was not just about the broadcaster Radio Free Europe, but also the exile movements that existed around it. A lot of the agent's information, it appears, originated in gossip and loose talk around the canteen table at the broadcaster. Pavel Minarek was not the only agent the Czechoslovak Secret Service managed to place at Radio Free Europe, but the archive information nevertheless portrays him as one of the most active and able agents it had. The problem for the Czechoslovak recruiters was that they could offer relatively poor financial inducements for anyone to switch sides. One of the most attractive incentives they had was to offer renewed contact with family and friends to those who had left the country. Many of the agents who agreed to cooperate apparently furnished little information of use, and Prokop Tomek believes that what they did furnish was probably agreed in advance with Western security services so that it would not damage the broadcaster or even confuse the Czechoslovak service about what was happening. Like his Polish predecessor, Minarek was eventually called home to an avalanche of publicity and appearances in January 1976. 170 journalists turned up for the homecoming press conference, 20 of them from the West. It was basically a big propaganda show. There was not just the press conference. Minazik appeared all over the place on the radio, television, and also on several television broadcasters from Eastern Europe. There were a lot of articles and interviews in newspapers and magazines. So it was a big campaign which was given the code name Infection. The whole idea was to create an atmosphere of distrust in Radio Free Europe and to discredit it in the eyes of the Czechoslovak public. The downside of such a propaganda and media circus was that the cover of the agent himself was totally blown and could never really be used again. According to historian Tomek, this was a pretty unprofessional approach from the Czechoslovak State Security Service. During his undercover activities, Minarik drew up three separate plans for bomb attacks on Radio Free Europe. None of them were carried out from Prague, but a bomb attack on the broadcaster's headquarters did eventually take place in February 1981. Several employees were injured, but no one was killed. It later turned out that the Romanian regime of Nicolae Ceausescu was behind the attack. As long as the Cold War continued, Minarek could enjoy a safe and secure future, even out of the public spotlight. After the massive propaganda campaign ended, the way was open for him to study. He studied in Moscow and Kiev. When the studies ended, he became the deputy editor and later the chief editor of the magazine Signal, which was published by the Federal Ministry of Interior. He stayed there until 1990 when he ostensibly left at his own request from the editor's post as an employee of state security. The end of the Cold War brought the need to find a new job and try to avoid a prosecution, which, with his former star status, always appeared to be likely. In the succeeding years, Pavel Minarik attempted to launch himself as a businessman, specializing in deals with the former Soviet Union. He was, however, later convicted of an insurance fraud scam. There were repeated attempts to bring him to justice for the preparations for a bomb attack on Radio Free Europe, but these all eventually fizzled out. The prosecution case against him was finally closed in 1994. Ironically, Radio Free Europe was already moving to change itself from the clear-cut CIA finance broadcaster when Pavel Minarik's undercover actions were proceeding. Basically, until the start of the 1970s, Radio Free Europe was financed by the CIA. 
That already began to be talked about in the West during the 1960s and the start of the 1970s. That system was eventually ended, and the U.S. government moved on to create a totally new framework of financing, which was around the time when Minatik returned. It was a lot more transparent. The Council for International Broadcasting was created, and it managed the operations of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, a station which was very similar to Radio Free Europe, but directed just at the former Soviet Union. The Council was responsible for financing both stations directly from the federal U.S. government budget. It was very transparent, and the same system continues to this day. Jij eerst? Nee, ik eerst. Doe maar samen dan. Oké, okay. let, let op. op. Eerste paasdag vanaf 1 uur zomertijd vindt op PI2NOS de eerste landelijke paasronde plaats door PD1LAM.